Hello, this is Justin Williams with the Wolfpacker Podcast. I'm joined today, as always, by co-host Matt Carter. And March is here. March Madness is upon us. And we're going to talk about the 2021 ACC basketball tournament. The men start Wednesday against Syracuse at noon. And the women just won their second straight ACC tournament championship in Greensboro this past weekend. Before we get too far into this episode, this podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending. With interest rates below 3%, there has never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again. Set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you are guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an a rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five-star reviews. Give Gage Kistner a call today at 480 401 one six eight one or email gauge directly at G Kistner at JFQ Lending.com. That's the letter G K I S T N E R at JFQ Lending.com. JFQ Lending Inc. Equal Access Lender. Licensed in over forty states. www.jfqlending.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. We're on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, Google Play. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can always listen to us on thewolfpacker.com. And if you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and give this video a thumbs up. Okay, Matt, let's talk about the ACC tournament. The men obviously start Wednesday at noon against Syracuse, but I want to start by giving credit where credit is due. The Lady Wolfpack winning back-to-back ACC tournament championships for the first time in program history. I was there. You said you had watched the games at home. Um, so I guess just to start, I mean, it's quite obvious. It's it's unprecedented for this program. This is uh, history in the making in the Wolfpack women's basketball program. But, Matt, just kind of your initial reaction to uh, seeing the women do it once again in Greensboro and also this time against, you know, the inevitable number one seed in the ACC, Louisville. Yeah, it would the, the the women are so much fun to watch. Um, they're so well prepared. Prepared. They are clearly talented. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen Connecticut enough, really, to to get a gauge on them. And you know, I'm not terribly familiar with Texas A&M and Stanford, but I haven't seen NC State against Louisville twice against South Carolina. You know, you're just hard pressed to imagine there could be a better starting five plus sixth woman with Jada Boyd coming off the bench than what NC they bring to the table. And, you know, they, they've shown they belong at the uh, with the elites. You know, I, I, you know, there's some conversation. Do they need to reach the final four to be considered, quote, unquote, elite? You know, maybe if you want the perception, but... The bottom line is they always play good defense. They're always going to be in the game. They're a tough team to knock out. How many times this year have we watched them, you know, see victory from the jaws of defeat, so to speak, with a late run? Uh, I think Boston College, Virginia Tech, twice in the ACC tournament with Georgia Tech and Louisville. They came from behind. Um, kind of reminds me of the, the Dean Smith UNC teams way back in the day where they, so many times you felt like you had them and then they came back and beat you. Uh, that's a sign of a really good team. That's the bottom line. This is a really good team. I don't know how it's going to shake out with the seeding. Maybe it doesn't matter. I, you know, I'm a bracketologist node on the men's side. I, I, I do it every year. You know, if, if you had put up entry state's resume, you know, over the years when I would be, you know, mocking out an NCAA tournament bracket on the men's side, I know I'd have them as a number one seat. And, uh, um, I guess the bottom line is clearly they can contend for a national championship. That's the bottom line, right? That's what we know. They can contend for a national championship. It's not fluky. It's not a dream. You know, it's not super fandom. It's reality. They can compete for a national championship. Well, I certainly agree. Um, you know, as for the debate about the one seed versus two seed, I know that's a popular topic on social media. 
NC State fans, you know yourselves well. You, you know you like to feel slighted, right? <laughs> There's a lot of conversation on social media about uh, th- this women's basketball team doesn't get the respect it deserves. And, and I would agree with you. I would make the argument that they should be a one seed. But bottom line, when it gets to the tournament, either NC State or South Carolina is going to be that fourth one seed. The other is going to be that number one two seed. They're ultimately going to collide in the Elite Eight if you know the bracket goes chalk. Plus, all the games are going to be played on a neutral floor this year, which is a little bit different than normal years in women's basketball, where you know the higher seeds will get their first two games at home. Unfortunate, because it'd be great to see this women's team uh, play a couple games in Reynolds, you know, to end the season and and head off to San Antonio to see what the destiny holds for them. But you know, we'll see what they can do. They're Certainly a resilient bunch, you know, as you mentioned. They trailed by 10 points in the semifinals game against Georgia Tech in the fourth quarter. They trailed by eight points to Louisville in the championship game early in the fourth quarter and somehow found ways to come back from those, you know, multiple possession deficits. Um, they have one of the best centers in the country, and uh, uh, Elisa Kunain. Um, you know, Reina Perez is just as solid as point guards can come. She is a savior for this team as a graduate transfer this offseason from Cal State Fullerton. And, oh, by the way, she's coming back next year, which really makes you excited for what the future holds for this Wolfpack team as well. But but you're right, Matt. They uh, they have as good a chance as anybody in the NCAA tournament. I I, I saw what UConn was doing this weekend, too. That's uh, a little bit scary. They just I believe they won their championship game in the Big East over the two seed. I believe it was Marquette. They won that game by about 43 points. They scored 80 plus. They held Marquette to less than 40. So that's a that's a solid team. Um, but you know, NC State is the only team in the country that has beaten the number one team twice, both times on the road. Um, so and they know they can beat South Carolina. So we'll see a lot of exciting stuff for the Wolfpack women, and of course, we'll have more coverage on the Wolfpack women as they head to San Antonio for the NCAA tournament on the Wolfpacker.com. Use that promo code PAC60 for a free 60-day trial. But Matt, let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about the men who start tomorrow. We're taping this on Tuesday, March 9th. They will tip off against Syracuse in the 8-9 game at noon on Wednesday in Greensboro Coliseum. Third time's the charm, maybe, Matt, because you go into this game, and Syracuse is a team that swept the season series with the Wolfpack. Um, but going into the season, Kevin Keats was 3-0 and against Syracuse. Um, and both of those games in the regular season were close games for the Wolfpack. Of course, the first being the road game up in the Carrier Dome, which was the first game without fifth-year senior guard Devin Daniels, who at that point led the team in scoring steals and assists. Um, so, you know, it was a team lost. It lost its identity. And then you throw in the fact that heading up to, to Syracuse, they find out they're going to be without – fifth-year senior forward DJ Funderburk as well due to university policies. He was only out for one game, but nonetheless, you take off, you know, two of your most experienced guys, two of your top scorers, um, you know, arguably two of your best players on the team, and they went up and played their probably, to that point, their best half of basketball in the first half, led by nine, and ultimately didn't get it done in the second half. Kadari Richmond, the freshman uh, backup point guard for Syracuse had a phenomenal second half. He tore up NC State's perimeter with his length. Because remember, at that point, NC State was still playing small. But NC State came up short three points in that game. And then in Raleigh, they lost by nine. They shot the ball well. Syracuse shot the ball well. But but NC State committed 20 turnovers. And that was ultimately the story of that game. So, Matt, uh, how are you feeling about this third matchup I mean it's tough to beat a team three times in a season particularly when you're not a great team Syracuse is a bubble team Uh, the loser of this game can go ahead and pack up their bags they're not going to the NCAA tournament but the winner still very much will have their hopes alive so Matt your thoughts on game three I think you hit on a couple of key points I think you're pretty two I think these are two uh, evenly matched teams I think you told me what Ken Palm had this as a one point game. Yep. Is that what you call me? Yep. Yep. I, I think that that sounds about right. Um, you know, uh, the second game, 
I thought NC State got into trouble trying to force feed the post on the baseline and the double teaming of Manny Bates and DJ Funderburg led to a lot of turnovers. Um, and that was a game where the, the front court really turned it over a lot. And I remember we talked about it a lot after that game. You know, if you cut that down, that, that game changed it dramatically. And then the first game, I really felt like Kadari Richmond was the difference. I mean, he kept Syracuse in the game at the end of the first half and made a huge difference in that game. Yeah, you know, what I like for NC State is they had a week to prepare. You know, it was very cool. I think what Thursday was it Thursday they they announced no Virginia Tech game. Correct. Um, and so important. they pretty much have had all weekend to prepare for the zone defense. Plus a couple of games, a couple of days here. Um, you know, you know Syracuse pretty well by now, and yeah, you know, the only difference is they're playing the other big guy. A little bit more minutes. I forget his name. Maybe you can help me out on his name. Oh, Quincy Garrier? No, the other big. Marik Dolzai? No, Are you talking about have... the guy that came off the bench? Yeah. He's oh. starting to play more minutes yeah, now. Uh, um, Breakwell or uh, Braswell, Robert Braswell. He had five no, no. points in five minutes. No, the other guy who's uh, been, I think his name is Evans. Oh, you're, talk you're talking about, um, you're talking about for Syracuse, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll pull that up, but go yeah. ahead and, and I'll blab it on while you pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that kid playing more minutes. Um, yeah, to me, the game is simple. Can it take, hey, take care of the basketball? It's Jesse Edwards, by the way. Edwards. And, and that's yeah. the guy that, along with Kadari Richmond, mm -hmm. you know, Jim Beheim made national headlines last week because he ripped into a reporter that apparently had a been. Five foot two reporter. Uh, apparently, uh, do we know his height for sure? I mean, maybe, maybe he's just I a short, shorter gentleman. I have gentleman. not seen him dispute it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I, look, yeah. it, it, we're not, uh, the height doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but Jim Beheim, obviously angry, must have been reading some tweets. I believe it was from the Athletic Beat reporter for Syracuse, yeah, it and was. he had tweeted something about you know according to his calculations, or maybe he retweeted it. According to somebody's calculation, Syracuse would only have two losses had they played Kadari Richmond uh, and the big guy, Jesse Edwards, both freshmen, um, more this season than Jim Beheim had been playing them. But, uh, you know, he got real sarcastic in a press conference and said, you know, That's a surprise. <laughs> after, uh, after 45 years, um, you know, he, he doesn't know anything. He's just glad that a 5-2 beat reporter that's never played basketball in his life was able to point that out. So, you know, to me it sounds defensive. To me it sounds like maybe this guy has a point. Maybe I should have. But um, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe that maybe that stubbornness will play into the Wolfpack's favor on uh, on Wednesday because yeah. we know Jim Beheim doesn't like being in Greensboro for too long. Yeah. Well, that's, that's true, too. For the record, I'm about 5'11". Justin, aren't you about 6'3"? Yes, so I, I told the the Baltimore radio guy we're doing a guest appearance on to preview the game tomorrow morning. Told him I'm I'm tall enough to talk about Syracuse basketball according to Jim Beheim's calculations. Sorry, so. sorry. yeah, uh, but it's all right, I, I really look take care of the basketball number one. You should not turn the ball over that much against a two three zone defense. Uh, but that was the low point of NC State basketball season right there. Um, you know, take care of the basketball, shoot well. And then, you know, the one thing that was the constant in the, in the two games, Alan Griffin got hit when he wanted it, I felt like, against NC State. Uh, they did not defend him well. He shot well. Uh, Buddy Beheim obviously, I think, shot pretty well the second game. So, you know, maybe the length going with the taller lineup will help out NC State there. But that's going to be a key, you know, is, is it to guard those perimeter guys for Syracuse. That's where the scoring is going to come from. So uh, see if this new look lineup can defend that a little better. Take care of the basketball and shoot well yourself. So, uh, but I, I, I foresee a nail biter. Yeah, I mean, I think that's to be expected in the eight nine game. It's the eight nine game is typically the the informal play in 
bubble team matchup, at least in recent years here in the uh, ACC tournament. But, you know, there's something about this third matchup. I personally feel good about the Wolfpack's chances. I mean, to me, Syracuse is kind of a team like Virginia where the more times you play them, the better you play them each time because you understand their defenses more and more. That's why that's why a team like Syracuse, if they were to get into the NCAA tournament, they're always a tough out. They always seem to be that bubble team, but then they sneak on to the Sweet 16 because these teams haven't seen the Syracuse zone all season, so they're all preparing for the Syracuse zone on short notice for the first time. It makes Syracuse a tough matchup, but NC State has the benefit of seeing that twice already this season. And plus, I mean, really one of the big things that, that ate NC State up, particularly in that second half of the first game, was just Syracuse's length on the perimeter. But now, as we've seen recently with NC State's starting five, they're going big. At, at, in those two games, they've started both Thomas Allen and Braxton Beverly, who are 6'1 or shorter guards, and Cam Hayes being the tallest in the backcourt at 6'3". Well, now with this new starting lineup that NC State has presented in the the five-game win streak that they had to conclude the regular season, uh, Cam Hayes is the shortest guy out on the floor. Then you put Darion Sebron at the you know informal two position or in the backcourt. He's six seven. Plus you got Helms at six seven, Funderburk at six ten, and, and Manny Bates at six eleven. So that that changes what was once one of the smaller teams in in the ACC into one of the bigger teams. And and we'll see how that uh, that matchup discrepancy plays out against the Orange. Um, another key will be stopping Syracuse from from shooting so well from the perimeter as you kind of alluded to um, Syracuse has been kind of a average shooting three-point team actually a little bit below average on the season they've shot 33 percent for the season which ranks just 212th nationally but in those two games that NC State played Syracuse they shot about 44.5 percent from three um I know they shot lights out in PNC Arena. So one of the key factors in that, Buddy Bayheim. Buddy Bayheim's had kind of a tough season. Um, he's one of their sharpshooters. He's a guy kind of like a microwave. When he gets hot, you gotta you got to account for him. Well, he went 7 to 12 from three in both of the meetings combined this season. Um, you know, shooting over 50%, that's pretty good for Syracuse. Bad for NC State, so maybe put a body on him. Make sure he can't did, uh, get open threes. I don't know if you had it in front of you. What did Alan Griffin shoot? Alan Griffin was phenomenal in that second yep. game. He shot four of seven from three um, in that nine-point home loss NC State had in PNC Arena. He led all scores with 22 points. Um, I mean, he, was ever, he also had three steals in that game. Alan Griffin was definitely the MVP of that second game. In that first game... He also had 19 points. He led Syracuse in scoring. He shot 3 of 7 from the field. So combined, he's shooting about 50% from 3. Buddy Beheim shooting over 50% from 3. You know, that I, it's reasons like that why I feel the law okay. of averages could yeah. play into the Wolfpack's favor. I mean, you know, who knows? They could – I mean, Syracuse is coming into the ACC tournament as hot as anybody. I mean, NC State's – as probably the hottest team in the league along with Georgia Tech. But Syracuse is coming off of two wins against Clemson and Carolina, which are both tournament teams to end their season. So, you know, I I, I agree with that, The your perspective, that it's going to be a close game. I just, for whatever reason, that third time leads me to believe that, you know, NC State might have the slight edge here. But um, it'll be very, uh, it'll be a competitive game because both of these teams should realize that you know, it's do or die time. It's uh, the loser is not going to be in the NCAA tournament. I think it's pretty safe to say, unless there was some major surprise out there. But yeah, uh, I would have to take a major breakdown of a. Well, let's put it this way: NC State is not going to the NCAA tournament if it loses this game. It would take a major breakdown of the bubble for Syracuse to probably get into the tournament if they lost this game. It would take an epic breakdown of the bubble. I will say this is a year with if they're going to be surprised by the NCAA tournament committee, it'll come this year. You know, yep. the, the data set is smaller, it's shrunk, it's more complicated. So this will be the year of surprises in the bracket, but I think you're dead on. The reality is that, you know, much like when Clemson played NC State, what was it, two years ago now? Two years ago down in Charlotte. Yep. 
you know, we, we at the time we thought maybe winner gets in to the NCAA tournament. Turns out loser is out of the NCAA tournament, and that's probably a more accurate way of describing this this game. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's a little bit more win and you're in for Syracuse. Definitely not for I think that's a good point you raised, Matt, because the bubble has changed a little bit since the last time we've had a podcast. Um, there's a lot of varying opinions out there on what NC State would have to do to get into the NCAA tournament with an at-large bid, presuming they don't win in Greensboro this week, which, by the way, they have 100-1 to odds uh, as of last week to win the tournament, I think. Because they got that buy, those odds now went down to 80 to 1. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, gives you a perspective of um, how confident Vegas is in NC State winning four games in four days. Um, But where I was going with that, Matt, uh, the national bracketologists seem to be a little bit more pessimistic on the Wolfpack than local media. Go figure. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But the bubble has not been doing itself any favors. There's a lot of bubble teams out there that are are acting as though they don't they don't want to be in the NCAA tournament. Um, the bubble is softer than it was a week ago. So Matt, what do you think NC State has to do to have I don't know at least a fifty percent chance of getting an at large bid uh, on Selection Sunday? Hmm. I, I still think as a byproduct of losing that Virginia Tech opportunity that they need to make the finals to 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 be 50 50 of getting into the field and i would argue if they get to the finals and presuming that presumed that the third game they play which would uh, you would beat syracuse you automatically play virginia and then the next opponent is questionable assuming that that opponent is either clemson or georgia tech and not a surprise run from whomever it could also be Miami or Pittsburgh right assuming it's not a soccer in one of those two teams I think that's a pretty safe assumption Uh, and you win that game between either Georgia Tech or Clemson at that point you it's funny how in my view you go from being just barely off the bubble after beating Virginia, in the conversation, but probably not on the upper tier of the bubble, but definitely in the bubble, in the conversation, to jumping all the way up into probably be a good chance of being in the field. Um, so it, it, it could be that thin of a line for NC State, but there's no question they have to win the first two at a bare minimum. Uh, there's no question about that in my mind. I don't, I don't think there's any question about that in anybody's mind. And then, and then the conversation starts creeping in. Uh, did, did they do enough, or do they to maybe want consideration, or do they have to win this game uh, in the semifinal? But I still, yeah, I kind of adopted your idea. Why not you just win the whole thing and take it take it out of their hands approach? Yeah. I mean, look, this is the most wide-open ACC tournament I can remember in recent history, Matt. I mean, the, to me, I'm I'm expecting a good amount of upsets. I don't think – I mean, look, you look at Virginia Tech as the three seed. I mean, they're going to be playing their third game in 30 days. I mean, that was a big loss for NC State at the end of the regular season, losing that, that home contest against Virginia Tech. I think it – if NC State were to win that game, theoretically, if that game was to go on, I think we'd be looking at maybe a two and two and your end situation in Greensboro, based on how the bubble looks right now. Um, I take a little bit more of a glass half full approach, Matt, with the with the ACC tournament. I think NC State's going to be right around 45, 50 percent odds of getting in the tournament if they can win two, if they can beat Syracuse and beat Virginia. Um, depending on how they would lose that semifinals game. If it's a Georgia Tech team that's you know playing red hot, they just blow out Clemson and then State plays them tough. Um, you know, I still think the committee will, will have to talk about an NC State team that at that point has won seven of their last eight games, um, including two wins against Virginia, who won the ACC regular season. Um, and Keith brought up a good point on his uh, 
press conference this week, you know, NC State has an argument to make that it has the best win in the conference. Because nobody, nobody else beat Virginia up in Charlottesville. They won the regular season. I know a lot of people uh, believe, and I'm one of them, that Florida State is actually the best team in the ACC. But, but nonetheless, I mean, State's got a case to make that they have one of the better wins in the ACC this season. Yeah. Well, Florida State didn't lose in Tallahassee this year. Um, right. So their, their losses came. So you, you have to balance uh, maybe Florida State's a better team, but beating, winning in Charlottesville, only one team did that, right? Yep. I mean, they've only lo- – prior to that point, I think they had only lost three ACC home games in three seasons. NC State was yeah. the last to do it last season. So Virginia doesn't and, and, lose in Charlottesville much. And how many teams beat Florida State in Tallahassee this year? Zero. Okay. Yeah. So they only win on the road against the two clearly top 25 teams from the ACC. And there's only two clearly top 25 teams in the ACC, where, where by NC State. So he has a point there. I think ultimately you just need more. You know, the problem with two wins, I think, is you could only point to beating two teams that are in the tournament. Virginia and UNC, one of them at home. There were three wins in that group, but you could only point to beating two teams in the tournament. Uh, that's a low number, and that would only probably be two quad one wins, unless Syracuse hangs on by that thread. I think they're 49 in the net on this Tuesday. Is, this is why the committee has such a tough job this year, because then you also have to look at how many opportunities NC State had against teams in in the NCAA tournament. They lost their opportunity against Virginia Tech. They lost a lot. They lost their opportunity to play up in Ann Arbor against Michigan, who's most likely going to be a one seed in the tournament. That would have helped them a lot. I mean, a a loss there wouldn't have hurt. A win would have helped tremendously. We'd be looking at NC State as probably a win in your end situation had they picked up that win. A lot of shoulda, coulda, wouldas, but I think think you hit the nail on the head, uh, Matt, about your, you know, I'm I'm expecting at least a couple surprises from the committee, and I've got a hunch that maybe they lean a little bit more towards the Power Five schools on this this year's bubble, just because a the Power Five schools were, you know, on average able to play more games this season due to you know maybe tighter protocols than some of the smaller conferences, and and b you know the NCAA missed their tournament last year. They want they want good ratings this year. They need to make their money this year, and uh, you know what sells is the big names, not necessarily the, the mid-majors. I know you don't really jump on that line <laughs> of thinking, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit more uh, jaded when it comes to my perspective on the NCAA. Right. Well, you know, the, I, I think you have a point in the sense that the mid-majors and the lower-profile programs have had very little opportunity to prove themselves this year. Um I, I don't necessarily buy the whole. They're, they're trying. They're going to work with CBS Sports and Turner Broadcasting to get the best field possible for the ratings. Um, but but all, you know, all, I, like if Duke went to the championship game, they won four four games in four days. You're telling me the NCAA is not going to let them in? I well, Duke had a pretty decent case at that point. I mean, I think they justifiably would be in even if, if their name was NC State and they had the same record. Um, you know, they would be justifiably justifiably in. I mean, you got to remember, I just, two weeks ago, I thought Duke was very close to being in the tournament. Um, so that would mean wins over Florida State, probably. Uh, a win over, who do they play in the seventh seed? Louisville? Yeah. So they'll yeah, play, I mean, I mean, they would have to beat three tournament teams, theoretically. Yeah, too. and they've already got some decent stuff on their resume. They just got a lot of bad stuff on their resume, too. Um, but yeah, yeah, but so I, I don't necessarily think that that would be because their name is Duke. If Duke wins, you know, if if, if Duke beats uh, Louisville in the first round, loses second round, uh, third round to whomever they play and, get, and got into the tournament, then I will say, Justin, you were a hundred percent right uh, about that. But um, yeah, we'll see how that plays out. But I think you bring up a good point that there is more opportunity for Power Five because the lower level team, the mid major team, just did not get. And that's not like the big power conferences snubbed them. It's just the reality of 
the hand that was dealt, you know, this year. Uh, and that prevented teams from, say, a UNC Greensboro or Winthrop or those type of teams from going out and getting a lot of good wins. Well, while we're talking about mid-major and smaller conferences, shout out to uh, the fellow North Carolina schools showing out, making the tournament. App State winning the Sun Belt tournament. They're making their first appearance in, I believe, 21 years. It's the first time in my conscious life that I think I'm going to be able to see App State in the tournament field, so that's cool. And uh, Elon's got an opportunity to get in as well. Um, I'm forgetting somebody. Man. UNC Greensboro, but yeah. entry tape. We do, your NC State fans don't like UNC Greensboro, so we can just skip over that one. Even after the Markel Johnson buzzer beater last year? I mean, as long as Wes Miller is the coach of a UNC Greensboro. Fair enough. I, I mean, I, I, it's UNC Greensboro. It's not UNC. I, I like seeing the North Carolina teams in. I want as many North Carolina teams in as possible, except for you know which team that you don't want in, but they're probably going to be in anyways. So. Campbell almost made it in, too. That's right. Camp, uh, they lost to Winthrop, right, in their That's conference right. tournament, which, what I mean, Winthrop deserved to be in the tournament. Small data point before we finish up talking about the ACC tournament. Um, watch for UMass Lowell, Lau, whatever it was. Mm. They're in their conference tournament championship game. Since that game was on a neutral court, if UMass Lau wins that game, they could conceivably jump – into a quad three. Minor that de- minor detail, but when you uh, when you're talking bubbles, every little detail matters. Matt, you were and then there's the whole then there's the whole Boston College Boston College no 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 Boston College in Miami. Yep. Um right now they are both quad four home games. If they could just pull off a shocker. Uh root for Miami. Over Pitt. Yeah. Although, is Pitt, is Pitt on borderline of, of hurt? Because NC State's got two wins there. Can they still be a nah, quad they'll, 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 they'll be They'll be situated in their quads all the way through. But Miami could go from being a quad four loss, which looks really bad, to a quad three loss, which honestly doesn't change anything about the nature of that loss, but it changes a lot about the perception of it. And their BC wins. BC has been going back and forth between a quad three home win and a quad four home win. Right now, it's a quad four home win. So, if they could somehow at least be competitive against Duke and jump up about four spots in the net, uh, that'll go back to being a quad three. So, Well, almost all of the bubble teams have at least one, if not more, of these bad quad three, quad four losses. Uh I mean, I'm not going to lie. You were getting me excited there when you were talking about UMass Lau, and then you said it'd bump up to a quad three game. And I was like, that's – you were you were selling that way too much. I was, I was maybe thinking quad two at least, quad, maybe quad uh, one. No, I don't know, no, what's, no, going, no, I don't know no, no, what's going on with them. But I know they're from a one-bid league. and um, yeah, I think that right now they're like 200 and maybe seven on the net. I mean, you have to be top 200 because it's a neutral. You have to be top 200 to be a quad three. Matt, so. I keep seeing the metric of wins versus teams in the tournament field. I don't know if that's actually a set of criteria that the, the committee looks at, <laughs> but if UMass Lau was to get an automatic bid, that would theoretically give NC State a third win against the tournament field. Well, would that potentially help? It won't hurt. I mean, that's for sure. I, I think they're more in the sense of quality wins, and the best way to measure a quality win is kind of looking at what teams would be an at-large bid into the NCAA tournament. And obviously, UMass Lowell is not an at-large bid. They're probably a 15 or a 16 seed if, if they did win their conference tournament. Um, so... Yeah, that, but that is a, uh, an important metric to, to measure one team versus another team, particularly at the Power Five, Power Five level. So, but this year is so much up for grab. For instance, strength of schedule. It's a classic use uh, data point, and Chief State fans painfully found that out a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we don't know what that is this year because they're not revealing. The, those information, and we don't know how much that's that's going to factor in uh, to the tournament selection. So, um, 
it's just a it's going to be a very challenging bracket to fill out and and don't forget nc state fans even if let's say nc state beats syracuse and then they lose a close one to virginia or they beat virginia but then they lose that semifinals game and it doesn't look so good there's still always that possibility in in the covid season 2020 2021 where weird things can happen that last four or that first four out matt correct me if i'm wrong here but i'm pretty sure that those are the four replacement teams if there was a team in the tournament field right. that, that couldn't play because of covid issues uh one of those teams would take that team's spot regardless mm -hmm. of seed so it could theoretically be a 16 seed but it also i mean you know let's say gonzaga and i'm I mean, that's probably the least likely team that would be out of the tournament for COVID reasons. But let's say they couldn't play for whatever reason. One of those teams would take that one seed spot. So you never know. It's uh, oh, they I slide know, it. Right. I didn't know that they slid it right into the seed line. They just they don't bump, bump everybody up. They don't reseed once the tournament field is set. If there's a COVID interruption, those four teams are on standby. And I mean, I think it's literally ranked on first team out of the field, second team out. But if NC State somehow ended up on that last or that first four out, if you will, you know, it'd be interesting to at least keep a monitor on things f for that week. Can you imagine the speculation that would happen on, I heard a rumor on uh, <laughs> this team's has a, a, a walk-on guard that tested positive. Are they going to be able to play in the tournament? Who knows? I just know that the streets would go crazy if Duke was that, that first team out and somehow they took like a two or three seed and ended up, getting in that way that would be the most classic duke scenario possible but anyways uh hopefully a lot there to get you excited for the acc tournament should be a good one this year the play starts today with the tuesday games luckily nc state avoided playing on tuesday which is something that i argued for and you argued against matt on our last podcast well that was under the assumption that uh florida state would the one seed so it actually works argument. I could have made an argument that NC State may have wanted to see Florida State in the tournament. Maybe that was before I saw them lose by 10 points at Notre Dame. I think they're going to be pretty mad once they get to Greensboro. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Eh. Yeah, nah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I stand by my, uh, but it does, it did work out. In that sense, it worked out perfectly for NC State. I did oh. not see Florida State laying an egg. At Notre Dame. And Notre Dame was probably fired up. Clearly, they're playing for Mike Bray up in Notre Dame, which is it's a good sign. If you're a Mike Bray fan, that's a good sign. Well, Kevin Keats agreed with me for what it's worth on that. It was important to get that Tuesday by. <laughs> and uh, particularly if you're going with my uh, methodology here, with if you're going to Greensboro and you're going to do all the you know COVID testing and all the hospitality, all that stuff, may as well just go win the thing. So if they want to win, much better to get that Tuesday by. Nonetheless, check us out on thewolfpacker.com. Use promo code PAC60 for a free six-day trial on all of our premium content news and analysis. There will be plenty of good stuff, men's and women's basketball, plus spring football practice starting today. So lots of good premium content to check out. Use that promo code PAC60 for a free six-day trial. Uh, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. We're on Apple Podcast app, Spotify, Google Play, everywhere you listen to podcasts. Plus, you can always listen to us on thewolfpacker.com. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give this video a thumbs up. Follow us on social media. You can follow our main account at The Wolfpacker. You can follow me personally at Justin H. Will. Give us a like on Facebook, NC State Wolfpack on thewolfpacker.com. And for Matt Carter, this is Justin Williams, and this has been The Wolfpacker Podcast.